And we're delighted that Dr. Cohn is with us tonight. He's a, uh, received his law degree from uh, Bar Elam, Elam University. He has his master's degree and his PhD from the Fletcher School of uh, Diplomacy. Uh, he's presently with the Heritage Foundation as a senior fellow. Uh, he'll say a little bit perhaps about what the Heritage Foundation is. It of course is a mildly conservative think, think tank as, uh, as the Brick, Brookings Institution is a mildly liberal think tank. We've had a, uh, several people from Brookings join us. This is the first time we've been fortunate to have someone from Heritage uh, address the council. Uh, many of you have probably seen Dr. Cohen on CNN or one of the other major news networks, uh, or you've read his column in the Washington Times, the least expensive of the local of the uh, area newspapers, uh, read by some of you, I think. The uh, he's written uh, uh, numerous articles. He's a highly regarded authority on on Russia. Uh, and at this time, when we look forward to the elections, which are so close, and the prospects of a uh, movement uh, in Russia in a direction that many Americans fear greatly, uh, it's a most topical uh, subject. So it's my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Ariel Cohen. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially in such a magnificent room. It's probably one of the m most beautiful room I, rooms I ever spoke in. And uh, I'm really very, very impressed with this building. And uh, um, I was uh, telling Dr. Uh, Bird before that I'm also very impressed with uh, the Baltimore Symphony, which I had a pleasure listening to a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, I work for the Heritage Foundation. I don't have horns. Um, and uh, I uh, do, I look at and write about and analyze Russia, Central and Eastern Europe, and countries of the former Soviet Union. I have a personal story to tell you about Baltimore and myself. 20 years ago, when my family left Russia, and I obviously left with my family, we had a friend in our town uh, whom I didn't see for 20 years, and that woman is uh, here today in the audience. Uh, she came from Russia a year ago, and this is the first time I saw her after 20 years. So uh, if this is not a land of opportunity, I don't know what is a land of opportunity. Well, the current joke in Moscow, one of the current jokes in Moscow is that Boris Yeltsin, the president, is interviewed on national television and the correspondent is asking, tell us, Mr. President, what is going to be your next presidency if you are elected? And Boris Yeltsin looks in the camera and says, I learned so much as a president. I learned about multi-party democracy and free press and dealing with opposition. I will be a new president. And the correspondent says, and if you're not elected, Mr. President, how your presidency is going to look? He says, it's going to be the old president. So the chances of Boris Yeltsin uh, running and winning the elections today, I would say, are about 50-50. So the situation is more serious than my friends and colleagues in the Clinton administration lead many of us to believe. Uh, Boris Yeltsin saw his population declining uh, since 1991, since we saw him standing on the tank. Uh, and the Russian people, unfortunately, because of the hardship of the transition to democracy and market economy, do not support their president as much as they used to. Uh, the other Moscow joke, and I'll try it in my free translation, uh, is that they interview a man in the street and they turn to the man in the street and say, please introduce yourself to the viewers and say, Ivan Ivanovich, Ivanov, uh, blue collar worker at Hammer and Sickle plant. 
And Ivan Ivanovich, what do you think about uh, the candidacy of Boris Yeltsin? He says, oh, he can go to hell. And the correspondent turns to the camera and says, and thus the labor people of Russia are endorsing Boris Yeltsin running for president. A lot is at stake in this election for the Russians, for their neighbors in the former Soviet area in Eastern and Central Europe, the Baltic states, and for, for all of us, for Western Europe and for the United States. Russia is facing a historic choice once again between continuous reform, democracy, the markets, and Russia reverting to old imperial ways, throwing its weight around, enforcing its will upon its neighbors and peoples in the area like it did in Chechnya under ostensibly democratically elected, or democratically elected but ostensibly democratic President Yeltsin since 1994. Another albatross around Yeltsin's neck, in addition to the terrible tragedy of Chechnya, where 30,000 people got killed, half a million people became refugees, is the question of crime and corruption in the Russian Federation, in the whole former Soviet area. Since 1993, over 40 senior bankers at the level of bank president to senior vice president of bank were shot and killed in Russia. Hundreds of business people got killed. Um, you have almost all businesses, or vast majority of business people, paying protection money, including Western businesses. Western business people were squeezed for protection money and oftentimes are forced to hire security companies that are run sometimes by the same mafiosi that they're supposed to be protecting them from. And the Russian public knows and blames the Yeltsin administration for the negative situation in the crime and law and order area. And we all know in this country, law and order is a big problem. In Russia, is many, many times more difficult. The other major issue, probably the major issue number one uh, in this electoral campaign is it is economy stupid. Um, for months and months, many salaried workers, ma many employees in Russia were not paid their salaries, which are meager by our standards. An average salary in Russia today is about $120, $150 a month. And even those salaries were not paid on time, and sometimes for several months over. I remember in 1993, I called uh, my friends in the town of Saratov, from which we emigrated, and said, before the elections to the parliament, how things are in Saratov. And my friends told me over the phone, the Yeltsin administration is crazy. They're not paying the workers. They're going to vote for Vladimir Zhirinovsky, the ultra-nationalist. Guess what? They did. In 1995, before the Duma elections, I called again, same friends, said, how are things are in Saratov? Said, it's awful. They're not paying the workers. They're going to vote communist. Guess what? They voted communist. Over 70% of the Russian population today in the polls say that they blame the Yeltsin administration for the difficult economic situation. Over 90% are saying that economic situation is grave or critical. And um, over 50% are saying that they're not afraid that the Communist Party will come back and take power. Now, I'm not trying to scare you and say that the Communists are going to be voted back in. After all, Boris Yeltsin enjoys the uh, privileges of incumbency. He is running what is known in this country as a rose garden strategy, running as a sitting president, or by, in Russian terms, a sitting Tsar. On the other hand, the old Communist Party, or the, the renewed Communist Party, enjoys the most 
uh, extensive network of party hacks uh, of old structures that remained there since the Soviet times. They have the most massive political effort, the best uh, get out the vote effort, and they are fighting to get back into power. Many of Russian uh, voters are still undecided, about 25%. Therefore, it's very difficult today to predict exactly how this undecided vote will turn. Are they going to be scared of communists coming back? And that's what Boris Yeltsin is hoping for, that the communists will come back to, to get the message out that the, the return of the communists is going to turn things for the worse, worse, which I believe it will. Or they're so disgusted with difficult economic situation, crime, corruption, and the war in Chechnya, that they will vote the rascals out and vote the new rascals in. Who are the other contenders for presidency today in Russia? Overall, the field started with 42 candidates. Now it's down to 11 candidates who are registered. Uh, the main challenger against Boris Yeltsin is the leader of the Communist Party, a fellow by the name of Gennady Zuganov. Zuganov used to be um, an apparatchik, a party worker, with the ideology department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, who became increasingly hardline during the Gorbachev's perestroika. When large part of the Communist Party became more and more liberal in Russian terms and abandoned the traditional orthodox ideology and Soviet imperialism, Zuganov and his comrades became increasingly imperialist, Russian nationalist, or should I say ultra-nationalist, xenophobic, hating the West, accusing Jews of all kinds of crimes against the Russian people, and generally not very friendly characters. So today, Zuganov and his party represent what we call the national communist ideology um, in uh, parallel with national socialist ideology that emerged in somewhat similar um, political situation in Weimar Germany between the two world wars. When a country was humiliated, defeated, uh, Russia was defeated in a Cold War, even if we say that we didn't win the Cold War, they certainly lost the Cold War. Um, there is a lot of animosity uh, towards the ruling elite uh, and perceived uh, betrayal of Russian national interests, whatever they are, by Gorbachev, uh, Yeltsin, Kozarev, the former foreign minister, and others. Um, Zuganov is an outstanding organizer. He is not a raving and ranting uh, nationalist like another presidential contender, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, who you probably heard of. Uh, Zuganov is very much a party machine man. He is good at building and running the party machine. But when you start talking to his senior political allies, and I talked to quite a few of those, uh, the senior foreign policy guy, his uh, deputy in the Duma, a woman by the name of Tatiana Goryacheva, who was in town in Washington last week, uh, his foreign policy advisor, Podbiryoskin, and others, and you start to press them on very significant key points. You get very, very vague answers. You ask about private property, and the, they evade an answer. They don't give you a clear answer that we are going to respect private property. You ask them about independence and territorial integrity of other countries in the former Soviet Union, and they do not unequivocally guarantee to you that they're going to respect territorial integrity of Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia, or Ukraine. So when communists are evading straight answers, what you want to do is to go look at their writings, at their political platform, the party platform, and the books Zuganov wrote. And what you find in these documents, what you find in those texts, is pretty scary stuff. Uh, it is uh, talk about great Russian 
uh, imperial uh, statehood that they're striving for. They're talking about uh, the eternal thousand-year-long confrontation between Russia and the West, a Russia that is separate from Europe, uh, that is playing a role of a Eurasian power going back to geopolitical theories of Mackinder and control of the heartland and whatnot. They take it very seriously. Um, and uh, rantings about the Masonic conspiracy, Jewish conspiracy, um, disdain for all non-ethnic Russian minorities in the former Soviet Union, Muslims, Chechens, Georgians, you, what have you. Uh, I was in the office of uh, the senior Zugana foreign policy advisor, deputy chairman of the Duma um, Foreign Relations Committee, deputy to Mr. Lukin, and I was looking for a bust of Lenin or a red flag, and I didn't find any of those. What I found was the Russian Orthodox icons on the wall, St. George defeating the dragon. So the symbolics have shifted. The symbolics are not communist anymore. But the essence is the traditional Russian imperialist essence. And that what uh, should turn on the red light. Besides uh, the ultranationalist Vladimir Zhirinovsky, who is also in the running and who is uh, always a, a man who is capable of a surprise in politics, Zhirinovsky is probably the best campaigner Russia has today. He connects to the audience great sense of humor, uh, great in the media. Uh, besides Zhirinovsky, who currently is not polling very high, uh, there is um, our great best hope, and that's a fellow by the name of Grigory Yavlinsky. Unfortunately, we don't see him uh, succeeding in the first round. The Russian presidential elections are two rounds. Uh, the two top winners of the first round slug it out in the second round. So by that model, uh, George Bush probably would be the president today if uh, he went uh, to the second round against Clinton. In any event, um, Yavlinsky is polling now between 8 and 10 percent max, and there are negotiations on the way between Yavlinsky and Boris Yeltsin on creating some kind of a coalition effort. Another interesting character uh, in the ring is a retired general by the name of Alexander Yeltsin. Uh, Alexander uh, Lebed, sorry. Uh, Lebed was a commander of uh, an army uh, in Moldova, a kind of a peacemaking operation. Um, rough and gruff fellow with uh, great uh, one liners, but he's lacking organizational base. He doesn't have a party of his own. He doesn't have a lot of uh, monetary support. And uh, we don't see uh, Lebed making it into the second round. There are others. Uh, probably the least popular in the field of 11 is a gentleman by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev that you probably heard of. Uh, I believe he was a president of the Soviet Union once. But the Russian people uh, are currently uh, giving him less than 1% of support, and it's 1% with a margin of error of 3%. Basically, we are looking today at three scenarios. One scenario is that between Yeltsin and Zuganov, Yeltsin wins. And we will have, maybe with some problems, maybe with some complications, I'll talk about these complications later on, but we will have pretty much a deja vu all over again. We'll have continuation of current policies, maybe a little bit of uh, a stronger Russian position, but in many ways continuation of Russian integration into the global trade flows um, as long as they can solve the economic problems and, and the law and order problems, which indeed are difficult. The second scenario is that Mr. Zyuganov takes over. Uh, in that case, um, I would not go as far as saying that all oh, the hell will break loose tomorrow. The hell may break loose in a year or two or three, dependent upon Zuganov and his people's organizational skills, uh, ability to mobilize resources for military buildup, and also the Western uh, position. 
If we send Zugana for clear message, what is acceptable and what is not, and we tried to do it when we met with his senior allies, um, then hopefully the Russian international behavior is going to be a little bit more benign than if we are weak, if we are trying to appease, and if, if we don't draw lines in the sand. Um, Zyuganov's people are talking about resurrection of central planning in Russia, uh, renationalizing of the, that property that was privatized, and indeed there was a lot of there, there were a lot of problems with privatization of property. Some of it, or much of it, was privatized uh, in violation of the existing laws in Russia. Uh, but uh, renationalization of such property will create more problems, not less problems. Um, they are talking about more control over the media, over the political process, and probably some kind of a witch hunt to eradicate Western influences as their nationalist ideology is much more pronounced. But there is also the third scenario, and that is a scenario in which either Boris Yeltsin or the communists step aside from the constitutional path, step aside from the existing framework that the Russian legal system, as imperfect as it is, delineates. I call it stepping on a minefield. And when you step on a minefield, you don't know uh, whether in your next step you're going to have your uh, leg or your arm or your head blown off. And this is what can happen. We saw the beginnings of it in uh, 1993 uh, when Boris Yeltsin was forced. Granted, he was forced, but he needed to bring tanks in the middle of Moscow and fire at the parliament building. We saw it when he went. He sent troops to Chechnya without asking for um, constitutionally, constitutionally mandated approval of the lawmaking body uh, of uh, having the troop involvement. Uh, so I believe that we needed to send um, a stronger message than we did already uh, in terms of necessity of preserving constitutional process and constitutional norms uh, in Russia and expecting that the elections will take place. In conclusion, I would like to focus on what I see as um, mistakes and uh, mishandling of the Russian situation by the current administration. And before I do that, I, I need to get a sip of water. So it's, it's just... First of all, the United States spent directly in Russia uh, over $4 billion since 1992 in assistance. And that's a good thing. The bad thing is who did we entrust with the money? The money went to an agency in Washington called the U.S. Agency for International Development. And that is the agency that didn't have any prior experience in any kind of communist country. Uh, they did not have the experience in transition from capitalism to, uh, from socialism to capitalism. They did not have the personnel, they did not have the Russian speakers or the area experts. So what they did was to bring the folks who worked in Pakistan and Kenya and India and focus in, in, in rural societies and have them work on heavily industrialized Russian society that had problems which were completely and totally different from what these folks experienced in the third world. I worked on a project with one of such uh, government uh, people and we were uh, above the Arctic Circle in the Russian port of Murmansk. Uh, if you remember from the Second World War, this is where the convoys came from, uh, Britain. And in Murmansk at the time, this was 1994, there were four fleets rotting at the bay. It's a port that is bigger than Baltimore Harbor. 
and you had the Russian nuclear-powered ice-breaking fleet, the Russian Arctic fleet, the military navy, you had the commercial cargo fleet, and you had a fishing fleet. And this woman took a look and said, gee, this is just like Zimbabwe. So I believe we poorly chose the implementing agency for assistance. U.S. assistance is extremely, extremely unpopular in Russia. It seeked to promote a lot of politically correct agendas, a lot of nonprofit, uh, third world oriented organizations uh, that receive the AID contracts. So the AID has this very convoluted bidding process for contracts, allocating the contracts for assistance in Russia. And these contracts went to those folks who were working with AID for 30 years in the third world. And this nonprofits came to Russia and decided to promote um, gender equality, um, to promote uh, issues in rural health care, all the stuff that they did and probably did well in the third world, but had nothing to do with the reform of the economic system, with privatization, with writing of laws and creating the institutions that can make market work. Secondly, on Chechnya, the administration was very lukewarm from the beginning in denouncing this carnage that led to the killing of 30,000 people and 500,000 refugees. And when the administration did not take a stand on Chechnya, the Europeans who initially were very negative against Russia on Chechnya all fell behind and did not continue the pressure. As a result, it was Boris Yeltsin who suffered the most damage. If we are trying to keep Boris Yeltsin in power, which the Clinton administration does, we should have advised him and should have applied pressure to end the war in Chechnya because this is one of the leading handicaps on his re-election chances. And when President Clinton went to Russia and compared the Russian carnage in Chechnya, by the way, time number three that the Russians are doing this to the Chechens since the forcible occupation of Chechnya 200 years ago, he compared it to the war between the North and the South, one of the most novel causes this country fought for, and implicitly compared Boris Yeltsin to Abram Lincoln, I felt ashamed for this statement and for the poor homework the presiden presidential staff did on this issue. Every school child in Russia knows that this is not like the Civil War, that Chechnya never joined any kind of union with Russia, and that this is basically a very uh, religious, very pious, Muslim people that did not want anything to do with Russia for 200 years. On another national security issue that bears directly on our security, namely the sale of reactors to Iran, the administration failed to propose to Russia a workable quid pro quo deal that would stop the dangerous transaction because Iran is looking for nuclear weapons capability. It's buying the reactors that are capable of generating weapons grade or uranium or plutonium that will be weapons grade through an enrichment process. And at the same time, Iran is buying missile technology from China. So we needed to stop that deal. Iran is one of the world's richest countries as far as oil and gas is concerned. They don't need nuclear energy. Uh, in order to power their industry or to light their cities. They have enough natural gas to do that. They need it for nuclear weapons. Another point is we failed to tell Russia unequivocally that violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries in the former Soviet Union area what they call their near abroad, the NIS, New Independent States countries, is absolutely and totally unacceptable. These countries are members of the United Nations. 
and it will be very detrimental for the West and for our allies in the Middle East if Russia embarks on building a new empire. And it cannot build a new empire if it doesn't bring back Ukraine, if it doesn't bring back the Caucasus states that are, number one, uh, are in a very oil-rich area of the Caspian Sea, and number two, are bordering with our ally Turkey and are uh, in the vicinity of the Middle East. Uh, people like Vladimir Zhirinovsky, the ultra-nationalist, uh, a fascist politician in Russia, advocates a very aggressive Russian policy in the direction of the Middle Eastern oil. He wants to capture Kuwait and uh, other um, Middle Eastern oil resources. Uh, and of course, this is a threat to our vital interests. To conclude, back in 1992, America enjoyed a lot of goodwill in Russia. Through our inept assistance efforts, through the rise of the nationalists and the communists, and through unequivocal support of Boris Yeltsin that was, was misplaced because as the Russian public abandoned Boris Yeltsin, we needed to, to appear nonpartisan. We needed to maintain a dialogue with broad circles of Russian elites, and we failed to do that. Uh, so we squandered that goodwill. We're not seen as much of a friend as we used to be. And the administration demonstrates a lack of clear sense of priorities and of a focus on our national interests in Russia. Thank you. The floor is open for questions until 10 after 7 at the microphone here. I, I think the question is, uh, uh, what threat is there uh, presently or potentially coming from Russia and the new independent states which might justify a defense budget the size of the present one? Well, first of all, I think it's a very, very good question because in order to have adequate defense, you have to formulate, look at, and analyze where the threat is coming for, from. I'm glad to tell you that we at the Heritage Foundation, which is a private nonprofit research organization, are doing exactly that. In fact, I just completed work, uh, which is a part of a collective effort on uh, writing the U.S foreign policy and defense blueprint, which will be available from the Heritage Foundation next month. And uh, Heritage is, of course, in Washington, D.C. Um, and when you're looking at threats, uh, especially threats from the former Soviet area, I should separate the threat to the American homeland, which is primarily would be a threat from um, the missiles, and as the society and the army or the military in those countries deteriorate, the control over the nuclear weapons, over missiles, and over nuclear materials, technology, and people who have that technology is deteriorating as well. So the missiles that can be accidentally or by a rogue commander fired at the United States uh, is a threat. And we don't have any kind of defense against such missiles. We don't have missile defense. And um, if a rogue general uh, or a sub commander, submarine commander figures out for whatever reasons, how to do that, he has a capability to do that. Even higher level of threat comes from proliferation of these missiles and technology to other countries which are seeking strategic nuclear capability. I'll name a few. North Korea is one. They just increased the range of their Dong-2 
missile that ca is capable of reaching of uh, reaching Alaska and uh, Hawaii, and they're continuously working on missile program, despite the fact that, as we know, their population is starving. Uh, we had a threat, a real threat, from Iraq. Um, Iraq was working on a nuclear program, uh, chemical weapons program, and biological program. And as Russian state crumbles, these scientists are available to work for the Muammar Gaddafis and Saddam Husseins of this world. They're working now for the Chinese. Several thousand Russian nuclear th scientists are working for the Chinese, and we hope that the Chinese government is more responsible, which I'm afraid is not, because it sells, nuclear to, uh, it sells missile technology to countries like Iran, Pakistan, and others. So these are just a few of the threats. Another threat which is on a different level, and it's not a classic military threat. And in the general, in the post-Cold War environment, it is a difficult transition for us from the traditional arms control, our nukes versus their nukes kind of threat, to different new threats, such as organized crime, which is transnational, highly, in case of Russia, highly educated, um, that has connections now to the Sicilian Mafia, to the IRA, as we just found out, this uh, proposed or threatened expulsion of nine British diplomats turns out, according to Time magazine, was connected to an effort by the Russian organized crime to sell nuclear materials and weapons to the IRA. The Russians called off the expulsion and start to blame a small country of Estonia of contacts, not of sale, of contacts with the IRA in a kind of traditional disinformatia, disinformation Russian uh, intelligence service operation. This just came out yesterday. So there are threats on the sub-strategic level. Uh, there are new threats, and there are threats from nuclear proliferation. Dr. Cohen, I recently returned from a long-term assignment in Moscow that was funded by your favorite agency, the USAID. So I will argue some of the points that you made in your speech, but we'll leave that for a later time. One of the observations that I made while I was there was the difference in generations, the young versus the old. And I was wondering if you would comment on how that generational difference can impact the upcoming presidential election. Well, I am uh, happy to do that. I was going over some polling data today, and what struck me was that in uh, young, educated, urban population, you have much greater support, not only for Boris Yeltsin, despite of his all obvious drawbacks that include things like conducting police uh, bans uh, on a trip to Germany uh, when he came out and decided to uh, conduct a band uh, and sing uh, Russian folk songs in the White House receptions. What I'm referring to, of course, is his chemical dependencies on certain uh, regulated and not so regulated substances. But uh, the Russian young urban professional class supports reforms in general. It is not supporting, for example, return to um, uh, state price controls, where the older generation, the group over 60, the pensioners, do support state price controls, uh, distribution of uh, goods as opposed to free sale of goods, and harken back much more to the communist uh, era. But as in this country, the retirees and people over 60 vote. And the youngsters hang out, have good time, and a lot of times don't vote. So uh, one of the biggest challenges for the Yeltsin campaign is going to be, and I was told so directly by one of his senior political advisors, to get the vote out for Boris Yeltsin. The communists do have the old time um, apparatchiks, old-time um, 
party activists who will be out there knocking on the doors. In fact, while Boris Yeltsin is dominating the media, the communists are dominating the grassroots. And we saw from Eastern Europe that in every country where the incumbent dominated the media, even such a uh, popular man as President Lech Walesa of Poland, he lost despite his control over the television. Yeltsin today dominates all three channels, all three national channels in Russia. He fired the director of the no Russian national TV channel for not being loyal enough. He uh, controlled the first channel and he just brought into his campaign uh, the director general of the so-called independent private channel. So he controls all three national channels. Does that automatically mean that Boris Yeltsin is going to win the elections. Not in my book. I hope he does. I mean, don't misunderstand me with all the terrible stories I told you about crime and corruption. For us, from our pure uh, self-interest point of view, he is a preferable outcome than Zuganov and his people. What influence does the Russian military have in Russian politics, and where do you see the loyalties of the military lying? I, I didn't hear the second half of your question, please. Where politically do the loyalties of the Russian military lie? Very good question. Um, the Russian military, um, first of all, is split within itself. Uh, the senior generals support more or less Boris Yeltsin and his very unpopular um, defense minister Pavel Gretchev. The rank and file and the NCOs massively vote for the opposition. They voted for Zhirinovsky in 93, they voted communists in 95. They are an unhappy bunch. They lost their prestige, they lost their budgets. In many cases, they lost their housing because the Soviet army was pulled out of Eastern Europe, pulled out of some of the republics, and brought into Russia, and the generals who were running the things didn't care. They put them in 10 cities in the Russian winter. This is a horrible thing to do to men in uniform who have wives and, and families and children. They sent them to Chechnya unprepared. The first three weeks of Chechen campaign were unmitigated disaster. So there is a lot of hatred and resentment towards Boris Yeltsin. I will have a hard time seeing regular rank and file army unit going and defending a Boris Yeltsin trying to steal the elections. It will be different units. It will be well paid, well fed security units led by Generals Korzhakov and Barsukov. Korzhakov is Yeltsin's confidant, friend and drinking buddy. He is the head of his bodyguards. Barsukov is uh, the head now of, of internal security police. These people are Yeltsin loyalists and their force will be out there defending Boris Yeltsin. Um, but it is not beyond imagination if some military commanders will attempt to support the communists, if the communists call for military support. And this is the chaotic non-constitutional or anti-constitutional scenario. Let's say Boris Yeltsin does, does win the democratic elections, but he wins by a very narrow margin. And the communists go out and say Yeltsin stole the election and call whatever military support they have. I don't have any indication now that Zuganov has built support among the military. But we didn't have those indications before the 1991 communist coup when Boris Yeltsin did make deals with people like Pavel Grachev who came to defend him at the Russian White House. Dr. Cohen, uh, given the size of Russia, it's the fact that it still has more people than the United States, nearly three times the, okay, about the same, but three, three times, more than tw two and a half times the territory, isn't there a natural limit to how the most wise American influence can possibly affect developments there? And isn't the future of the Russian state in the hands of the Russian people for better or worse, regardless of who is in power in this country? 
Well, uh, the Russian state today is 148 million uh, versus U.S., what, 250. Um, the old Soviet Union used to be 300, and they let half of it go for very good and serious reasons. Uh, obviously, there is a limit to what we can do in any major country, but there is a limit to what we should do or shouldn't do. We should not intervene in internal political campaigns and go to the election rallies of foreign leaders. Bill Clinton did it with Boris Yeltsin and footed a bill, uh, or at least lobbied very actively, for $10.4 billion of the IMF credits plus $1 billion of the U.S. Exim Bank credits to uh, boost Russian civil aviation industry. Bill Clinton also did it with Shimon Peres of Israel. And some people at least see it as interfering with, into internal affairs of uh, sovereign countries. What would we think if Prime Minister of Japan came to this country and stood with either Clinton or Dole, make your pick, uh, on a mass meeting and endorsed, to all intents and purposes, uh, his friend Bill or his friend Bob? I think a lot of Americans would resent that. And by the way, when uh, De uh, John Major did it with, with George Bush in 1992, there was one very upset man in town, that was Bill Clinton. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is about Americans. And since I have some question as to whether this country actually won the Cold War, because our government seems to me to be more socialist than what our Constitution says it is. Uh, we're, we have long since strayed from what the Constitution limits on federal powers. And it makes me wonder whether we could support freedom in Russia with our own ambiguity being the way we are in this country, where a lot of Americans can't tell the difference between the Declaration of Independence and the Communist Manifesto. Well, one of the things I still praise in the old Soviet Union, and I hope uh, you take it uh, in good cheer, is uh, the education uh, a kid could get in, in their high schools. And it uh, horrifies me when I taught college here uh, and, and saw the level of uh, ignorance among the student body. Um, it horrifies me sometimes uh, what Americans know and, and, and don't know. Uh, on the other hand, if the Russian public today, after 70 years of communism, after having between probably 40 to 60 million people annihilated in concentration camp camps by Lenin and Stalin and after. If that public can come and vote for communists, uh, then it indicates to me something much broader than just nattering about Americans or American education system. It indicates to me that unfortunately the human race doesn't learn from history. It doesn't learn from the lessons of history. If Russians who suffered bitterly from the Germans can vote for Nazi party or neo-Nazi party or for Vladimir Zhirinovsky's of this world. Or for that matter, if we can vote for Pat Buchanan. Um, it, it indicates to me that we don't learn, we don't look at history. And uh, this is not a very happy conclusion. Um, as far as our promoting freedom, I th think we should promote freedom. I think I'm standing here today because the United States promoted freedom and demanded freedom of emigration. Um, and um, a lot of people in that part of the world are still looking at the United States, at the shining city on the hill, as to, with all the drawbacks, with all the limitations, they're looking at the U.S., at the society that implements liberty in the most effective way. What I would caution again and warn again is what happens in Washington when we selectively use the cause of freedom for very cynical, in a very cynical way, for very utilitarian purposes. I think in the long run, we undermine our national interest by doing that. I just spoke to a very close friend in St. Petersburg today who's a professor at the Electro Technical University, and she made two very 
surprising comments. One is that she polled her classes, which are young people, as to whom they would vote for. And they all said Zuganov because of the Chechen war, because they've lost so many of their friends in that war. Um, the second thing that was surprising was that she said an edict has just come down from Yeltsin that they at their university must let go 100 professors and other universities have been, which is 10 percent for them, other universities have to let go as many as 30 and 40 percent of professors, which doesn't seem like a very uh, astute thing to do, so close to an election. So I'd like your comment on those two things. And the third question, uh, third is a question. Do you have any feelings about the mayoral uh, elections in St. Petersburg on Sunday? Which um, is going to be changed to gubernatorial. I have, I have strong feelings about mayoral elections in Washington, D.C., but I won't tell you what I think about it. <laughs> um, in terms of letting professors go. Some professors in the Soviet, former Soviet Union should have been let go. These are professors of Marxism, Leninism. These are people who stayed in the universities and continue to brainwash the students. I mean, one of the most chilling things that you see today is the appearance of students who never lived under the Soviet system as, as I know it or as, as, as I knew it or my family knew it or my grandfather who was shot knew it. And these people are voting communist without really understanding what this, this party did to their country. And this is because a lot of old communist professors stayed in social sciences and there is no alternative or there's very little alternative. There, there are no institutions to train political scientists or social scientists to replace those old professors of Marxism-Leninism. I once gave a lecture, a speech, to uh, that audience in Moscow of old communist professors. This was the most hostile, ignorant audience I ever spoke before. And finally, the mayoral elections in St. Petersburg. Uh, Mayor Sobchak, as you know, was uh, a Democrat. Um, again, as in many other cases, there are lots of allegations of crime and corruption. In his administration, um, unlike certain mayors in Chicago and other cities that we know in this country, um, so I frankly don't don't know who would be a better mayor for St. Petersburg. I'm sorry. If you were an advisor to the Czech or Hungarian prime minister, would you consider which of the candidates would you consider is in the best self-interest of Central Europeans? Uh, uh, can you repeat it closer to the mic? Sorry. Please. If you were an advisor to the Czech or Hungarian prime minister, which of the candidates would you consider preferable for Central European self-interest? They all prefer Yeltsin. They prefer Yeltsin, as somebody put it today at a conference at Heritage, because this is the devil that they know versus Zuganov, who is the devil they don't know. Um, the Russians seem to slightly changing the tune on NATO expansion. The most ex important thing for the Czechs and Hungarians today is the expansion of the NATO. And the Russians are saying, well, we tried to say net, 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 now let's, say, let's see what we can get in the negotiation process. We had a senior Russian diplomat speaking today at the Heritage Foundation um, at a conference, and this came across pretty clearly. They don't want the nukes in this new, new members of NATO. I think they're perfectly legitimate not to want the nukes, and I, I think we should, we should let them not have those nukes. Uh, there are other demands that they're advancing, some of them ludicrous, like those countries should stay uh, within the Russian-made weapon systems or should continue continuously purchasing, uh, continue, continue to purchase uh, the weapon system, as, as Jim Baker used to say, it's all about jobs. Um, but seriously, um, I think, and I, I talked to all of these uh, governments, uh, I was in Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, last year alone, and uh, they would, they can live with Boris Yeltsin, let me put it this way. Um, one of the problems with the Russian foreign policy establishment is it disdains small countries. Sometimes our foreign policy establishment is in small countries. But the Russians in particular have this complex of great power. They don't like to talk to Czechs. Uh, Hungarians traditionally had good relations with the Russians. 
Um, but the Russians prefer to speak to us, or to the Germans, or to China. And uh, they should be pay just paying more attention to the neighbors next door and be good neighbors. And then a lot of these problems that they have with the Poles or with the Bolts would go away. I'm intrigued by your three scenarios of the election results. Yeltsin wins, Zhuganov wins, or a minefield. You seem to be implying that Yeltsin, because of his support with the internal security forces or the top generals, might overturn the results of the election or refuse to hold the election. Do you see that as preferable to a Zhuganov victory? And if so, why? This is, uh, first of all, yes, uh, Yeltsin uh, signaled or his very senior people, like the chief of bodyguards and the drinking buddy, uh, signaled that they might not hold the elections. Um, as somebody quipped, um, we don't know who is going to be, uh, we, d we don't know who is going to win the elections, but we're sure that Boris Yeltsin is going to be the next president of Russia. Um, I do give them, by the way, benefit of the doubt. Uh, so far, Yeltsin behaved vis-a-vis uh, -vis the election question, both in 93, and this was a very difficult situation in Russia. Uh, the, the lives were at stake in 93. And in 95, he behaved as a good Democrat. So I believe there is a personal commitment there. He has some people on his staff who believe that it's very important to hold these elections. But looking at it from a perspective of a, a good Russian democratic, democratically inclined patriot, to give power back to the communists who learned nothing and forgot nothing is a very tasking proposition. I would leave it at that. I think Boris Yeltsin, or his entourage rather, would be very reluctant to part with power, even if they lost the elections. They have means to manipulate the results. But if Zuganov wins by a wide margin or by a landslide, I just don't see how Yeltsin can cling to power and slug it out with the support of the military or the security forces without plunging Russia into a terrible chaos. We're in your debt, of course, for uh, sharing your, your time and your, your understandings with us. It's been a most informative evening. And uh, as everyone has indicated, we, we thank you very much.